Hey everyone, my name is Sam and thanks for checking out this video. Make sure to hit the subscribe button down below and the bell notification. And if you get to the end and enjoy, give the video a thumbs up. Just, you know, the gist. Yeah, this week, read an offensive amount of books and also managed to get myself addicted to High Hopes by Panic at the Disco. So, I mean, it was actually, like, kind of a productive week for me. Yeah, I'm particularly proud of myself that I've listened to music that is not BTS, which, you know, that's, you know, it's a baby step dealing with addiction. So yeah, so let's talk about the books that I read this week. So first off, I read Unwind by Niall Schusterman. This is book one in a, I believe it's a quartet, um, the Unwind Quartet. So this is set in a world where to deal with the sort of perpetual argument of pro-life versus pro-choice, they came to this kind of conclusion in, I believe it's kind of a dystopia in the United States, basically, after the Second Civil War, where you are essentially forced, you can't abort a child, but at the age of, between the ages of 13 and 18, you can be unwound, which essentially they can take your body parts and do whatever it may be done, use you as an organ donor, whatever. And uh, once you're 18, though, you can become a regular citizen. So we get multiple different points of view. We have a boy who's got, um, he, he's, troubled. He's got a family, but he, he gets in trouble an awful lot. He can't sit still. He doesn't like to listen to rules. Then we also have a female who is in the government care system. She was um, abandoned by her parents. And then we have a boy who was, uh, his family had him in order for him to be unwound. It's a religious thing that they see essentially to like sacrifice him. It's, it's an interesting concept. And we follow them as they sort of almost have like a darkest mind set up of they're trying to join a rebellion and get to the rebellion sort of aspect um, and be smuggled to safety to try and make it to the age of 18 before they are forcibly unwound instead of being sent to the unwind center kind of with like if you've read The Darkest Minds then you see the parallels. This was an interesting book actually. The concept is like immensely problematic is probably the right word. I mean, that's the entire point of the book is like this entire debate of like forcing people to have kids and then they, they grow up and it, it just these multiple point of views was very, very interesting. I also like that they included someone from a religious perspective because that always, always, always plays a role in these discussions. So I, I will say, I don't know that the, I hesitate to call it a romance. Two of the characters like kiss a couple times. It's not really a romance or anything. I don't know that it was necessary really in the book, but other than that, I thought it was like interesting. Schusterman just takes these like really weird concepts that have like morals or values or discussions that we have in our current time period and then applies it to a book. Um, I'm definitely going to read the sequel. Number two, Unholy, I believe it is. Yes, Unholy. I'm curious to see where they're going to go. And there was just this really interesting quote. Actually, it was my quote of the month. I have to find my planner. One second. Oh, actually, one really interesting part that before I get to the quote thing that was interesting that was brought up was the concept of like terrorism in the name of, which I'm, I'm so curious because I know that there were people that would like attack people like they sit at abortion clinics and like harass women going in and out or there were people that like literally killed abortion like doctors performing abortions or like um vandalized clinics and all these things so there is this concept in here that also does come up of having they're called the clappers and essentially they make themselves human bombs by putting toxins in them and if they clap essentially like almost like a spark um it they go off it's incredibly interesting um concept. I feel like that's all I really say about Schusterman's books, but that's basically the point of him. We have a right to our lives. We have a right to choose what happens to our bodies. We deserve a world where both those things are possible and it's our job to make to help make that world. And I think it's like that's basically the discussion that we're all having now. And I feel like it made a statement like the way that it's that quote is like glorified as to where Schusterman stands and what's good and what's evil and like letting people control their own bodies. There's also some sections that are almost kind of like Lord of the Flies-esque of like what happens when like you just like let teens basically try and survive in these like encampments and there's always always going to be some people that are power hungry-esque and yeah it's just very interesting and weird. Then I picked up Senlin Ascends by Josiah B Bancroft. I, I keep wanting to say Bancroft. I don't know why. Bancroft. So this is book one in the Books of Babel. It's supposed to be four books in total. Book four comes out next year, I believe. Book three just came out. 
Uh, this is a weird, another incredibly weird book. It's more of a fantasy kind of Russia feels, but our main character is going on his honeymoon with his wife and is, Thomas is, he's the main character. He's just like this, like, like low key kind of quiet schoolmaster in the small village. And then all of a sudden he marries this like insanely beautiful woman and everyone's like, how did he pull that one off? But they go for their honeymoon to this place called the, the City of Babel. It's essentially this like tower where there's like layers upon layers upon layers. He's been fascinated with his whole lifetime. He loves teaching about it. He wants to go see it. So they go see it. And like as soon as they get there, he loses his wife. And it's the whole process of being inside the actual tower, trying to find her. And it's very like, it kind of reminded me of Vasa in the Night, but very much less confusing writing and stuff like that. It's almost like Vasa in the Night meets the Winters, or what's what's the, is it the Winter Witch trilogy? The Catherine Arden series that just finished. Um, the Bear and the Nightingale, the first book of it. Caraval feels as well. Like once you get in the tower, like there's absolutely no idea what's going on. It's, if you liked the concept of Caraval, and I know some people didn't like Scarlet in that, there's no like kind of Scarlet-y character really for the most part. It's just that like lost and chaos and being disillusioned and you don't know which direction you're going in sort of thing. So yeah, think of it as like that's in the night, the bear and the nightingale and Caraval. Yeah, that's probably accurate description. And I'm definitely going to continue with it. I really, really enjoyed it. Then I did a reread of The Thief by Megan Whalen Turner. How do I explain this book? Our, our main character is starts off, he's in prison. He was caught for essentially bragging about being the best thief in the kingdom. And so the king decides, well, I need something stolen for me. So he hires him and kind of kind of insinuates, you know, he'll probably get freedom if he can steal this precious rock from the Queen of Atolia, um, which, hint, Book two is called The Queen of Atolia. <laughs> um, so we follow him as the kind of guards for the king travel to her kingdom to steal what they need to steal. And it's his whole POV. This isn't a fast paced book by any means. It's a fantasy, but it's pretty steady, like lower paced. Just a lot of kind of questing and adventuring for the most part. But it's not a long book. It's good paced for this. I think if they tried to make it like, ooh, it would have been like dreadful, but it's, it's, it's good uh, pace and length wise. This was a reread for me from like a year and a half ago. I completely forgot about what happens at the end. There's a massive twist at the end, a big reveal of like who's aligned with who that I don't understand how I forgot that that happened. But I remember I re just reread it and I was like, oh crap. Oh my God, I remember this. Oh man, that got me the first time too. So I don't want to say what it is, but I really enjoyed it. I am I, I enjoyed it more the second time around. Maybe it was just paying more attention um, to Jen and like the adventuring that they went on and the like finding of this gem and everything like that. Oh, it's just so interesting. And yeah, I'm definitely going to read The Queen of Atolia either in March or in April. I finally did it. I finally did it. I did a reread of A Breath of Snow and Ashes by Diana Gabaldon. This is book six. I think it's six in the Outlander series. I It's, it's kind of difficult. This is more of a filler book. Um, I think as someone, it's I think it's a pretty common opinion, actually, of people who enjoy this series. It's more of a filler book. There's it is 800 pages, I know, which can be large filler books for some people. It's just a lot of like historical detailing and questing and like, it's an Outlander book. So Claire gets kidnapped and like Jamie, you know, saves her. Or Brianna gets, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, the ending is where I get really excited for this book. Yeah, it took me like a month and a half to finish because of all the interruptions I had, but I finally finished it. Then I did a read of The Dreadful Tale of Prosper Reading by Alexandra Bracken. And oh my god, I am a horrible person for delaying reading this for as long as I have. I think this book has been optioned off to be a TV show. I believe that's what I heard as well, which very curious. Okay, if you've ever watched a very Potter musical, A, we're best friends. Two, if you haven't, go watch it. I don't know why I said A and then two. That's, you know, A or B or one or two. Either way, if you've ever watched... <laughs> A Harry Potter musical where Joe, I think his name is Joe Walker, who plays Voldemort, is literally on stage. Like it's a college production, right? Is literally walking around back to back on stage with the guy who's playing Professor Quirrell. And they, they, they have this like bromance. And like, if you enjoyed that comedy, you will thoroughly enjoy this book. The main character, Prosper Redding, is essentially being like his mental thing is sharing a soul or sharing space with this like evil villain soul named Alistair. And... <laughs> 
Alistair just ab throws hurls abuse at this kid of like, Maggot, what are you doing, Maggot? Also, I listened to the audiobook of this and like the narration of the audiobook was so good. I like, burst out laughing throughout this whole book. But it's Fallen Prosper Reddick, basically at the beginning of the book. He thinks his grandmother's trying to kill him. <laughs> when his parents leave town to go to China for something. And then he finds out his whole family's like prophecy thing. And basically he's essentially got to be sacrificed. Very, very funny. It's fun, um, but not very juvenilely fun. I think for a middle grade, it's actually kind of straddles the middle grade YA border. I'm definitely going to pick up the sequel. I definitely want to see if I can get a copy of this off of Book Outlet too. I just really, really, really enjoyed it. It's so fun. Then I did something bad to my soul. I read The Vanishing Stair by Maureen Johnson. I can't really summarize anything in here other than it picks up exactly where the first one left off with all of the questions that you had. It doesn't answer really any of the questions except for like maybe one or two and then just raises a billion more questions. I don't even know which I need answers to more anymore. I just I need to know about all these murders going on and like ugh. However, it reminded me there's like this whole section of like finding secret tunnels under their their dormitories, which I don't know if I'm the only one who watched them. But when I was young, YTV had this show called like the House of Abacus or like Arubus House or Arab something house. It was like these kids were like in this like prep school dormitory and they just happened to have mythological paths and puzzles and treasures underneath their houses. I mean, how cool would that be under their dorms? Sorry. So they just keep going on these like weird kind of Indiana Jones adventures, but for like middle grade YTV level audiences. And it was just that it, for some reason that just reminded me of it, of finding tunnels under your house where people use to escape and like murder other people and smuggle things and kidnap people. It's a messed up book series, okay? And I need number three. There's no information. There's no title. There's no summary. It just says 2020, I think, on the Goodreads, which how dare you make me wait another year? That's just unreasonable. And last but definitely not least, I read The Lost Queen by Sing Pike. This is not a fast paced book. It is a historical fiction book, like full, like full stop. There's no fantasy. No, no, it is full stop a historical fiction. If you do not like the details and the times and the development of the history and like the atmosphere and everything of Outlander, you won't like this book, okay? Just like full frontal. I, this is my trash for historical fiction. Though. But as the kind of blurb says, it's Outlander meets Camelot. So in 6th century Scotland, this is a real, it's about a real woman. I want to make sure I'm trying to try and pronounce her name properly. Langrith. She is the twin sister to a boy we'll call uh, what's the easiest way to explain this yeah she has a twin brother and that man is who historians believe the myth of merlin was based on so real life merlin he's not a real wizard or anything but i don't know why i just clarified that y'all aren't stupid but it's her twins her, her twin brother and he's a warrior she is married off to the nearby king to try and benefit the family the area geographically in scotland is being christianized they have you know christian monks and uh, missionaries have kind of infiltrated and are causing problems between the traditional Celtic Druids and the people slowly, some of the people convert, con converting. And of course, naturally, as always happens when conversion of any religion, people find geographical spiritual place. And all of a sudden that is the spiritual place of like five different religions. So everyone starts warring. Yes. And there's a lot of political religious turmoil throughout this whole book it's several years there's they're written in parts though so part one is when she is younger like 10 11 years old then we jump to her being like 16 and getting married and then we jump to her when she's in her like early 30s and things start really like catching up there's obviously like a forbidden love romance it's it, i mean it's it is kind of insta lovey but it's not written cheesily insta lovey they're never really in the same geographic area for basically all the book so it's not super annoying or distracting but I think how it's written is very complimentary of the historical fiction and the time period but like she's constantly throughout this book dealing with the fact that she was married into this other family forcibly in order to try and benefit her blood family and then she's so she's trying to kind of play both of these sides and it's not as easy as she thought and there's these issues of politics and religion as well as geography and like who rules who and like these power struggles and like yeah, it was just really, really interesting and a good historical fiction. And I did throw my book once whilst reading this. And in, in it, um, the Christian missionary 
goes and asks one of the Celtic Druid guys who like there's already tensions in these community he goes up and is like our grain stores are like our we had a bunch of failed crops or something like that we have no food give us some of yours like didn't offer to pay even though he's been like going around taking like cash and everything from people and taxing people he shouldn't be taxing but he goes to this Celtic Lord and is like give us some of your grains and the Celtic Lord is like no nah, not my problem you have money I know you have money Go deal with yourself. So then this, like, the Christian missionary guy essentially, like, organizes and has his people uh, attack and steal a bunch of grain. So the Celtic Lord, like, goes and, like, to their high duke king guy and is like, this is what happened. And then, like, the Christian missionary is like, but unst to God. God did this for us. And God is, it was a gift from God. And I, li I can't stand when people use use the re religions like that and like it's it's not just in medieval history like people do it all the time and like abusing it for power and all these other reasons and it's just it makes me cringe like i just oh i hate that of of like well the lord said it so i can justify doing it it's like no no <laughs> so those are all the books that i read this week let me know in the comment section down below what you read this week i'd love to know and if you've read any of these i'd love to know your thoughts Make sure to check the description box down below. I will link all of these books to their Goodreads pages, and I will also link all of my social media. If you follow me, I will follow you 